Tonight you'll be dining with some shale CEOs. What do you want to get out of it? Well, I'm actually not attending that, that, that uh, dinner, so I don't know what they're going to get out of it. But if I was, uh, obviously you want to look at what the investment profile and how Africa is provided for, particularly Nigeria. That's obviously my interest if I was well, at the dinner. And you, and you heard from the IEA director uh, today talking about the fact that it's really going to be shale that's going to account for about uh, three quarters of all the demand that we're going to see over the next few years. In your mind, then, how does OPEC fit into that? Well, first, OPEC is a 30 percent producer. So if shale is going to take the balance of the market and leave us with a 30 percent, maybe that's nice. But I, I don't see that happening. Um, there are cost issues. OPEC still remains the cheapest producer in the world. Uh, we're going to keep working at that to keep getting those numbers down. And a point will come when really, quite frankly, when you begin to look at number comparisons, uh, you're better off with a, an OPEC crew than, than a Shell crew. So it's, it's um, I think ultimately, uh, both people who work in the Shell environment and those who work out of uh, OPEC type countries, uh, and for that matter, non OPEC type countries that are not within the Shell environment, we need to begin to get some commonality for understanding because protecting the oil industry is key. It doesn't matter where you're coming to from it. If you get the numbers too far down, we've seen what happens in terms of shale business. If you get it too far up, we'll see what happens in terms of consumers. So a stable oil uh, produ production and supply market is key. And I feel like what we've learned is that when you get to a 60-65 kind of conversation, the oil price, shale can respond very quickly. We're already back to up to 800 rigs here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that OPEC needs to rethink the idea of higher prices? It's lower forever, not just for longer. Well, well OPEC doesn't focus on price. It focuses, one, first on being the least cost producer. That's sure, one. but, Two, yes. you know, you're and not going to like and a $30 and oil and then at price. least if you stabilize the market, the market responds. So we don't go out there saying it's got to be 60, it's got to be 70. I do agree with you that the higher the number, uh, the more uh, share, share response. But bear in mind that also share technology is getting better by the year. Uh, at some point it was very uncompetitive to do shell above, below 50. Today uh, you can have shell ab about 38 uh, and it's getting better and better. So ultimately we're going to look at um, the comparison between shell and normal production. It's going to shift away from, from um, the, the advantages of when shell can get active so what, which, who is producing the best quality, the best price type oil, and who can service the immediate markets around them? Markets are getting regionalized now. Mm -hmm. And so you see children in a lot of the U.S. and Latin America and the rest, uh, while OPEC type crude is getting to Asia and the rest of them. So enough market there, but what it says to you is that technology has become more and more important right. in the process of okay. producing oil. The other striking thing from the IEA report this morning was that uh, they said that the supply cuts that OPEC has implemented would have to stay in place until 2021 to avoid another surplus. What do you think about that timeline? Well, the first thing I say is that that is not the responsibility of OPEC to keep stabilizing prices all alone. The whole world is going to look at those sort of numbers and say, what do we do up to 2021 to get a stable market? Yeah, but because, it's not because, legal because, for the because, U.S. producers to do well, that, well, so it really well, does rely I hear, on you. I hear, I hear that argument, but each time OPEC does it, then somebody takes advantage of it, but it's legal to take the advantages. So I think, I think we've got to get to a point where the focus on OPEC being the driver for stability of the oil market has got to begin to shift to the stability of the oil market that involves a consensus of all. Uh, so OPEC keeping their numbers where they are to 2021, I, I can't speak for the whole of OPEC. Certainly we'll look at each, each year as it comes and look at the dynamics of the market and decide on what to do. But, but, you but, I, but, I've, do but I've counseled, I've counseled that, that the time has come to begin to reach out even to shale producers, to companies. You know, because the nice thing about shale is that they're also uh, owned by companies that are doing business all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, there isn't a group of people who are called shale producers and a group of people who are called crude producers. They're, they're, it's all one and the same. And everybody's got to begin to get outside the existing structure between OPEC and non-OPEC countries, including Russia, and begin to get into a global type discussion in terms of how to get the market to survive. So does that mean that you'd be an advocate of an exit strategy this year for OPEC and non-OPEC? Um, no, no, no. Uh, we're very supportive for the rest of the year in terms of what we've signed. We're all locked into it. We love it. I think it's doing what, we're, what it's supposed to achieve. What next year? Um, next year, we'll look at next year when next year comes. We can't forecast what's going to happen next year. Um, but you have to be thinking about an exit strategy absolutely, because but the I'm market's gonna, worried yes, about yes, but, the but, deluge. But, but it is something we do consensually. It is not something that one of the ministers of an OPEC country comes out and says, this is what we're going to do. We're taking the numbers, we're taking the research as the Secretary General, as the Secretariat. We look at those numbers, we make a decision. We still have nine months to go in terms of what we've, what we've agreed as an extension. A lot of the options that are sort of being floated is that an OPEC, non-OPEC agreement, including Russia, might just last a while. That, the, that you guys would just work together. Perhaps you'd have some cheating that would be allowed. Perhaps you'd have kind of a, allowing X amount of barrels to come back every month until, unless prices collapse. Can you give me a hint of 
about there, where there you is, would prefer there, to see? There, there is positivism in terms of the relationship, and there's a lot of buzz and energy around it. There isn't anything that shows me that it's going to end mm -hmm. pretty soon. But again, we're going to keep looking at the dynamics. We're obviously going to be reaching out across, across the divide. Uh, to look at shale producers and their individual rights to say what can we do collectively to stabilize the market. Uh, so yes, uh, is it going to last past this year? Potentially yes. Uh, but in what form? I don't know. How much is Nigeria producing now of crude? Uh, the, the crude serves about 1.8 million barrels and, and then we also have condenses which are about 300, 400,000 barrels. Yes. And are you respecting that? You expect to respect that 1.8 uh, million barrel a day absolutely. cap? Absolutely. We're, we're keeping that. Even if you get to a $65, 70 environment? We'll, we'll keep that. I, I think we're, we're, we're prepared to work together, not work individually. Uh, so even if the price blows up even to 100 not likely, of course, um, we, will, we will still sit down and say, well, how do, how do countries go? Because the last time we all tried to go it, at it individually, it caused chaos in the global oil market. We're not going to do that again. And the other big point that came out in the IEA report is that uh, they said that companies are not investing enough uh, for future demand to meet future demand. Now, you just had a really big conference, an oil conference in Nigeria. What did you learn about companies' investments overall and in Nigeria? A lot of buzz, a lot of energy, a lot of willingness to look at specific targeted markets, especially markets that have matured. Uh, new investments in new greenfields, pretty slow. Uh, so countries like Nigeria will benefit from that. So we're having a lot of investments. Uh, uh, we have potential um, FIDs on the table close to 40 uh, billion um, dollars um, over the next one, two years. So very good. Uh, our target is about 100 billion because of the infrastructural decay and replacements. Um, but yes, um, the scarcity of funds is beginning to get better than it was two years ago. Com companies are more willing to take risks now, but they're looking more at mature markets than, than fresh markets, and, and that's the challenge.